Okay, before we get into hedging, it's quietening down a bit. Before we get into hedging, I'm going to need your assistance with this. It's nothing too complex, um, but just bear with me. It won't take long. So we talked about CDOs at the start, and we talked about, I mean, they obviously had an impact on some of what was happening uh, in the market, and obviously had quite a big impact. One of the criticisms, we talked about another criticism of accounting, but one of the criticisms, the second criticism of accounting around this period of time was that the way banks accounted for things didn't allow people to properly understand what was happening, or didn't allow people to understand what was happening with their loan books. So imagine all those people right there. They're people we've lent money to. Now, of those people, do you think every single person is going to be, and there's obviously going to be more than four people that we lend money to, will every single person pay the bank back? No. There's no way that's going to happen. Like when you're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of people, whether they were never going to pay them back, whether they couldn't pay them back, whatever, not everyone is actually going to be able to pay them back. So one of the problems with that is the model I'm about to show you, because this is how the banks used to account for things, um, or at least how most banks did. Now, whether or not they should have is a different issue. I just realize I'm... We'll bring this up. Okay. This is not something technically that we need to know for class, but I think it is something useful because it's picking up how, I suppose, the regulators are responding to things which are going on. Now, you don't need to understand most of what's going on in this. Christ, I don't even understand half of what's going on in this. But what is happening is, let's imagine you guys are all in the market for home loans. You guys, you know, you finished, you finished up here, you've gone off and got good jobs, you're making good salary, you go out, you want to get into the property market before, according to all the pundits, it just goes way too high. And you need loans to make that happen. So every single one of you need, requires a loan. Let's just assume I've got a fair bit of money. I'm one of the, did you actually see this? There are now over a million millionaires in Australia. Um, there are actually, there's, so there's quite a few kicking around. So let's just assume, just for argument's sake, that I happen to be one of those people and I've got a lot of money and I'm willing and able to lend to every single one of you. Now, we're not trying to figure out who in the room isn't going to pay me back. But as you look around, do you think that every single person in this room is going to pay me back my money over 30 years? don't have to point at people, but um, probably not. And again, may not be because you didn't want to. Maybe something bad happened, and hopefully it doesn't, but maybe something happened negatively over the next 30 years and it just wasn't possible. Who knows? But the way the banks used to pick up on that is what was, co what was called the incurred loss model. So an incurred loss is when one of you guys that I've lent money to, when one of you guys actually default. So at that point in time, one of you actually default, and I say, okay, well, hang on, something's bad here. And I go, then I show that. And I show all that loss at this point in time. But that means from a user's point of view, we don't really, we're looking at this information and we don't have a good sense of, if I've lent to all you guys, that I am concerned. Because the bank would have, an, have a concern about what's going on here. And they say, oh, hang on, some of them are not going to pay us back. So what this model is trying to pick up on, and this is something which was issued, this, this model, the red one, is what the ISB has proposed this year. This is what they, what they want to be able to do. They're saying, right at the start, right when I give you guys, lend you guys all this money, I am going to show a small loss allowance right here. So right at the start, I'm initially going to show a little bit. And it's going to stay pretty low until at whichever point I look at this, the loan book and I look at how the loans are tracking and go, oh, hang on, S some people are starting to look problematic. At that point for those guys, that would jump up quite substantially. Um, I'm pretty sure the FASB, I could be wrong with this, is the blue line. So the Americans are saying, yeah, we want to show stuff at the start, but we want to show a lot more. Um, you can see it sort of ends up being fairly similar afterwards, but there's just a divergence at this point. But all I just want you to take away from this is that Initially, during the GFC, a lot of those loans, no one would know there'd be a problem until that problem actually happened. 
Whereas what we're trying to pick up, or what the ISB is trying to pick up now is, okay, let's show a little bit of it now and let's let it track through and incrementally come onto the books so we can kind of recognize that there is a problem. Ah, derivatives. So, forwards, futures, options, swaps, we're not worrying about these, we're focusing. Today we'll just be looking at forwards and futures um, in terms of the demonstration. There will be options in the tute work, but options work relatively easily in terms of how we do the accounting for them. We'll talk about hedges in a moment. So a futures contract, futures and forwards, for those that are doing finance, you're probably aware of the differences. Economically, and from, from what we want to get out of it for this subject, there's not that much difference. What they are is a, is a contract, that's important, it's a contract to buy or sell an agreed item, agreed quantity of an item at an agreed price at some future point in time. It's a futures contract, so you're going to do something in the future. It could be that, you know, I'm a farmer, and this is how a lot of these things started. Commodities, you know, if, you, if you're growing, at, growing animals, if you're growing animals, shearing sheep, doing what, whatever it is, it may be some time between this activity of growing them and selling them and getting them to market. And there's a risk there that the market may fall out. You want to get some, some guarantee on price. You set up a forward situation where it's like, I will sell this X amount of wool or X amount of pork bellies or whatever it happens to be at this point in time, sometime in the future. And that way, look, you may end up worse off than if you left it to the market because the market for pork bellies, the spot price when you ultimately sell it could have gone through the roof and you've done yourself out of a lot of money. On the other side of things, the market for pork bellies could have gone through the floor, in which case you're actually better off than had you done nothing. You win some, you lose some on that, but the idea is that you're taking risk out of the equation. I've set it up now, I know what price I'm getting, I can kind of ignore it. Uh, in terms of how they're delivered, in terms of how they're traded, they do differ, but this, the essence of them work very similarly to what we need to be worried about. An options contract is slightly different. Um, whereas with a forward or a future, there is a contract and you, okay, no one goes through with delivery nowadays, but they will take an opposite position and close everything out. Um, with an options contract, you can have an option to do something and if things look bad, then you just go, I don't want to do this. You could have an option to buy shares at $40 a share. And if when it comes time to exercise the option, the shares are actually trading at $20 a share, and this is a buy option, why would you, ex you wouldn't exercise it because you could just buy the shares on the market for 20, so you just don't run with that option. On the other side of things, if the shares are worth 70 and you could buy them for 40, absolutely you're gonna use the option and if you want the actual asset, keep it, or if you just wanna make a profit on it, either sell the option or just buy and sell straight away and you make some money. What we are not interested in is how we come up with the pricing for options. If you're doing finance, you, you do do that from memory. I did finance, a finance major a while ago. But I'm assuming you do go through option pricing. You look at the black Scholes, black Scholes, model, Scholes model and binomial. We don't look at how we price the option. If we have any questions with options in there, we'll just say this is what they're worth. 